this video, we will be walking through how to follow isotopically labeled carbons of glucose through various metabolic paths in order to determine the needs of the cell. This is a skill that we will utilize throughout our discussions of glucose metabolism and in our in-class activities, so be sure to pay close attention. Isotopic labeling of metabolites such as glucose are a great tool for scientists to probe how cells are undergoing metabolism in a response to various controlled or uncontrolled stresses in the environment. Often we label metabolites in specific positions and either collect waste products such as CO2 and measure them for the presence of the label, or by isolating various products to check and see if they have the label. Before we move forward, we should check to make sure you understand the labels that scientists use to indicate which carbons are labeled within the metabolite. The most common nomenclature is to indicate the atom's position by a number and type by the atomic symbol and which isotope they are using by the atomic weight as a superscript. For example, if we label carbon 1 with carbon isotope 14, of glucose, then we would use the name 1,14-C glucose. Sometimes scientists will label every carbon in the metabolite. In that case, they will use the letter U instead of a number to indicate uniform labeling of all carbons throughout the molecule. There are a variety of pathways that glucose can take once the cell begins to metabolize it, and the path it takes can tell us a great deal of information about what the needs of the cell are. For instance, if the cell is getting ready to divide, glucose may start in glycolysis, then enter the pentose phosphate pathway to make NADPH for the biosynthesis of macromolecules and R5P for the doubling of nucleic acids ahead of cell splitting. Some will probably also go completely through or enter back into glycolysis from the PPP and then through the citric acid cycle to make more ATP since ATP will probably be needed to provide energy to the growing and divided cell. Often, we can track glucose's progress through these various pathways by looking for specifically labeled carbons as CO2. As you see here, we give off CO2 in the pentose phosphate pathway, when pyruvate is converted to acetyl-CoA, and during the citric acid cycle. What is cool is that these CO2 molecules come from very specific carbons in glucose, and we can look at their ratios in order to determine what is going on inside of a cell. In order to track these carbons to see which ones come off as CO2 where, we need to keep our numbering straight, starting with where the carbons from glucose end up in pyruvate and at, at the end of glycolysis. Overall, this is a tricky process that takes practice. I recommend grabbing your textbook or a printout of this slide and following along with me so that you can repeat this process during our in-class activities or on an exam. As I mentioned, we first need to look to see where the carbons from glucose end up on pyruvate. Recall that at the end of stage one in glycolysis, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is cleaved into two three-carbon long chains, DHAP and GAP. DHAP is then converted to GAP. When that happens, each carbon from glucose finds an indistinguishable buddy, and eventually we end up with two molecules of pyruvate, where the methyl carbons are carbons one and six from glucose, the middle carbonyl is carbons 2 and 5 of glucose, and the carboxylic carbon is carbons 3 and 4 from glucose. For the purposes of this activity, we will color label these carbons in pyruvate as we track them along their conversion to acetyl-CoA and their path through the citric acid cycle. Carbons 1 and 6 will be blue, carbons 2 and 5 will be red, and carbons 3 and 4 will be yellow. Before we enter the citric acid cycle, pyruvate must first be converted to acetyl-CoA. Recall that this is governed by the enzyme complex pyruvate dehydrogenase and that we lose our first carbon from pyruvate as CO2 during this conversion. This is the carboxylic carbon, that is carbons 3 and 4 from glucose that we lose as CO2 in this step. 
Now, if we had labeled these carbons isotopically and we see isotopic CO2 being emitted from the cell, we could be fairly confident that the cell is actively undergoing glycolysis to make pyruvate and that that pyruvate is being converted to acetyl-CoA. However, we cannot say for sure whether or not the citric acid cycle is occurring. Recall from the lecture that acetyl-CoA is a common intermediate in a number of other processes, such as fatty acid synthesis and amino acid synthesis. But it, coupled with other information the cell provides, can tell us a lot. Now, let's continue tracking glucose carbons through the citric acid cycle. In the first step, the incoming acetyl-CoA, colored in red, is complex to oxaloacetate, colored in black, to make citrate. Conveniently, the acetyl-CoA carbons in this figure, or the carbons that came from pyruvate, will remain red, while the oxaloacetate carbons will remain black during the first half of the citric acid cycle. As we continue around the citric acid cycle, you will see that CO2 is given off in steps 3 and 4. However, in the first cycle, these carbons are coming from oxaloacetate and not from pyruvate. However, as we continue in the cycle, the pyruvate carbons eventually become oxaloacetate in the second turn, and carbons 1 and 6 and 2 and 5 from glucose get distributed within the molecule. In a second turn, a new acetyl group is added, and the old acetyl group then begins to lose its carbons as CO2 in the second round. First, we will lose carbons 2 and 5 from glucose in the second round of the TCA, and carbons 1 and 6 come out in preceding turns at these same steps. Kind of cool, huh? So basically, if we want to measure the flux within the citric acid cycle, then we want to label carbons 1, 6, and 2, 5, as those are the ones that are lost as CO2 in the citric acid cycle eventually. However, Labeling carbon 1 can be misleading. Can you think of why? Recall that in the pentose phosphate pathway, we also lose a glucose carbon as CO2. In the first stage, as 6-phosphogluconate is converted into ribulose 5-phosphate. By now, you've probably figured it out. Carbon 1 is the carbon we lose in the pentose phosphate pathway. So, if a cell is utilizing the PPP, we could also see isotopic CO2 emitted if we had labeled carbon-1. Often, scientists will leverage this and run simultaneous experiments where some cells are given uh, isotopically labeled C6 glucose and some cells are given isotopically labeled C1 glucose and will compare their ratios. If there is a significantly more isotopic CO2 from the C1 batch compared to the C6 batch, then we can say that the cell is utilizing the pentose phosphate pathway more than the TCA and may tell us something about what the cell is doing. However, if the ratios are 1, meaning the same amount of isotopic CO2 is coming out in both experiments, then we can probably conclude that the cell is not utilizing the pentose phosphate pathway, at least not the first stage. Well, I hope you found this little tutorial helpful, and if so, please follow me on YouTube so you can find more of my videos. Thanks, and have a fantastic day.